thanks to my mentor, uh, <laughs> Darren. God, it is so great to be here. It's great to be at the college. It's great to be back in Maine. Uh, it's particularly great for me to be back on this island. This is a, uh, a very special place for me. It's a place where I used to come over the summer off and on my entire life. It's a place that in a very real way helped to instill in me an enduring love of the outdoors, which I have to this day. It's the place where I got married. Uh, and it's a place where I now bring my kids, uh, so it's near and dear to my heart. Uh, and I've also been a longtime fan of the college, um, but I've never had the good fortune to be here when you guys are actually in session. So uh, I'm really pleased to have that chance. I'm grateful for it, and I look forward to um, a, the dialogue with you this afternoon. Uh, as, as Darren said, we used to work together at, um, at World Wildlife Fund, and if you had told the two of us that less than a decade later, we would be sharing this stage with Darren as the president of the college and me as the owner of an organic farm. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure either. Of, I think we both would have been pretty surprised. I guarantee you I would have been very surprised. Um, my, my career was in um, environmental policy. And as Darren indicated, I started out working on US public lands issues. And then I moved on to um, uh, more global issues, most notably uh, global warming policy. And I was sort of at the center of the action. I was in Washington, D.C. I was working for all these great organizations. But what I found was that almost the larger the organizations I worked for and the bigger the issues I worked on, the less I felt like I was really kicking the ball downfield. And I realized that most of my days <laughs> I spent going from meeting to meeting to meeting, and I was spitting out a lot of fancy acronyms, and I was spewing a lot of rhetoric about how we could protect the environment and grow the economy and alleviate poverty and do them all at the same time. And I began uh, really to doubt whether I believed everything I was saying. And maybe more critically, uh, I felt increasingly divorced from what got me into this business in the first place, which is a love of wildlife and a love of nature. So in response to all that angst, right, I did something that could charitably be called uh, unconventional uh, and more accurately probably be called nuts. And that is that along with my, my family uh, seven years ago, uh, we purchased a farm. Um, and what I want to do this afternoon, along with my colleague Sam Quinn, is tell you a little bit of the story of that farm and what it is that we're trying to do there. And based on what I understand about this college and what I've already seen today at the Peggy Rockefeller Farm and at, at, at the Beach Hill Farm, uh, I think we have a lot in common in the way that we're thinking about agriculture and thinking about conservation. And I certainly look forward to learning <coughs> from all of you uh, this afternoon, and I hope that these presentations will, will stimulate a dialogue. So I wonder if we could um, dim the lights down. And um, I want to start by uh, orienting, uh, uh, let's <laughs> turn them up so we could do that too, but I, there we go, that's what we're looking for. Um, let, let me start by orienting everyone a little bit. So Sunnyside um, is located in a place called uh, Rappahannock County, it's about 70 miles west-southwest of Washington, D.C. Um, what I really want to call your attention to in this slide is the location of the farm within the landscape, because that, to me, is one of its real defining features. The farm is the um, black polygon you see, and everything to our north and west pretty much is Shenandoah National Park. And everything to our east and south is private land and primarily agricultural. And to me, that location, sort of right at the intersection between a wild space and a human-dominated space, is part of what gives the farm its dynamism and is part of what attracted us to it in the first place. And it's a theme that in one way or another I'll be coming back to, and that I know Sam will as well. So this is uh, a, a, a map of the, uh, of the property. As Darren indicated, the whole place is 422 acres. But as you can see, fully 50% of that is forested. And those forested slopes go straight up to the National Park. So we, uh, um, we manage the property with two primary objectives in mind. Uh, the first one is to try to operate a viable, successful, organic agriculture business. Um, I would like to stand up here and tell you that I'm the farmer. I am not the farmer, and that's a good thing for the farm. <laughs> when, we, when we purchased this place, I did not know a lick about agriculture, and I probably now know just enough to be dangerous. Um, but we rely on a terrific staff. This is Sean McDermott, our farm manager, and he is um, ably assisted by several other full-time staff, but also 
every year a number of seasonal workers uh, usually come in April and stay through November. If we're lucky, we get a couple of them to come back for a second year. And to me, they are, uh, in a lot of ways, the heart of the property. They add a tremendous amount of energy. They do an awful lot of work. And in the middle of the summer, you rarely see them standing straight up, smiling like this. You normally see them like that, um, uh, basically uh, uh, hunched over, pulling weeds or harvesting um, produce. We are uh, primarily a vegetable operation. Vegetables are really our stock and trade. We grow between 45 and 50 different varieties of vegetables every year, all of them certified organic. Uh, we also uh, have um, uh, an orchard uh, that produces Asian pears, uh, a number of apple varieties, and um, two varieties of sweet cherries. And as of the year before last, uh, we started producing honey. The guy in the bee suit on the right is Sam, who among his other uh, responsibilities takes care of um, our bees. You'll see him during the slideshow in many different uh, sort of conservation manager uniforms. So this is, I think, one of his favorites. Um, somewhat unusually for our neck of the woods, we are a year-round producer. We have a number of um, high tunnels that are uh, passively heated uh, where we grow uh, greens throughout the winter. So uh, not to sound cliché, but uh, having this farm has literally transformed the way that I and my family think about uh, food. Um, uh, in terms of uh, what we consume, in terms of uh, uh, when we consume it. And it's also changed in, in very real ways our perspective of what food, uh, good food, real food, can look like, um, what it can smell like, what it can feel like, and of course, most importantly probably, how it tastes. And this is a journey that we've been able to share, I think, in s substantial ways with the communities that we serve. And I want to talk a minute about, uh, about that aspect of it. So we are primarily, not exclusively, but primarily a retail operation. We have a community-supported agriculture program. I guess this audience probably knows uh, a lot about CSAs. I won't go into great deal about the concept, except to say that our CSA is on farm. So our share members come once a week for a six-month season to the farm to pick up their produce. This, to me, is almost the most rewarding thing that we do, and it's for a couple of reasons. The obvious one is that we don't have to spend uh, any labor or any fuel transporting our food anywhere. We have our customers coming to us. Um, but the other reason that the CSA is so rewarding to me is that it really, in a fundamental way, anchors the farm in the community. And for our staff, when you're meeting your end-use consumer every week and looking them in the eye, that engenders not only a great sense of pride but also a tremendous amount of accountability and it creates a tremendous incentive to produce the highest quality product that you can. And especially, you know, when those consumers are also your neighbors and, and, and your friends. Our most important uh, marketing outlet from a dollar standpoint are farmers markets and we sell at two of them. Uh, one in the DuPont Circle neighborhood of Washington, D.C., and the other in Northern Virginia. If you had said uh, 20 years ago, if you'd stopped somebody on the street in Washington, D.C., which is where I grew up, and you'd said, point me to the nearest farmer's market, you know, they would have looked at you cross-eyed. Uh, there really weren't farmer's markets in Washington, D.C., and the growth in the support for the local foods movement um, has just been dramatic in that time period. Now, what the, so, so there's been this tremendous proliferation of farmer's markets, and that in very real ways has changed the value proposition for small and medium-sized farms because it's given them a much wider range of options for selling their produce uh, at, a premium, uh, uh, at a premium price. And there is now not really a single major neighborhood in Washington, D.C. that doesn't have its own farmer's market. Uh, it hasn't hurt that we've had support for the idea of building more sustainable uh, local food networks uh, at the highest levels of government. And we were very privileged and pleased as a farm to participate in the opening of the White House Farmers Market several years ago and to have as our first customer the First Lady. So on that note, anybody that is in the room that's in the farming business should be very suspicious because I've told a very happy story. <laughs> about Sunnyside. And I will be totally honest and say that it is by far the most humbling thing I have ever done 
it is a very, uh, as I'm sure all, all of you understand, it is, it is a very difficult business. And there are the range of problems that uh, uh, farmers have dealt with uh, for years and years and years to contend with. But what has been particularly interesting to me has been to be, if you will, on the receiving end of some of the issues that I used to work on from a completely different angle in the policy world. Uh, one of them is um, climate change. Uh, and we have seen since we've owned Sunnyside, uh, I really can think of two events uh, that I would call extreme events. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you that these events are directly attributable to climate change. But it is certainly the case that these are the kinds of events that we are likely to see more of in a carbon charged world, for certain. This is what um, the farm looked like in November of 2012 when Superstorm Sandy hit. We got 65 mile an hour winds, and we got nine inches of rain in a period of about as many hours, maybe a few more hours than that. Um, you remember those wonderful high tunnels I showed you? Well, we lost three of them as a result of that storm. The other event that comes to mind was a heat wave in the summer of 2012 that was astonishing not for the daytime high temperatures, which were high, but for the minimum nighttime temperatures. Five consecutive nights in July, we did not see a minimum nighttime temperature below 80 degrees Fahrenheit. For where we are, that's unprecedented. So another issue I used to work on was invasive species control. Uh, I couldn't have told you five years ago what that was. Now, um, it's, I, I'm going to use the Stephen King uh, analogy again, Sam, but it, it's like a bad Stephen King novel. This is the brown marmorated stink bug. It comes from China. Um, it has spread like wildfire in the east. And it is now entirely ubiquitous uh, on our property. And that's literally over that time span. They get into apples. They get into peppers. They get into tomatoes. They get into corn. And it's, it's a, um, they are a significant and new pest with no natural predators. This is a terrible slide, but I had to show it to you. Um, this is the little critter right there. It's called spotted winged Drosophila. It's a fruit fly. Uh, it's of Asian origin. It came, was first seen in the United States probably maybe five years ago. It's now ubiquitous in the east. And what makes it especially pernicious is that the female has a body part called a serrated ovipositor. It's really a serrated ovipositor. That basically means that she can drill into, saw into unripe fruit. And then she lays her eggs in the middle of the fruit, and the eggs hatch, and the larvae eat their way out. So the consequence is you're sitting there holding a blackberry in your hand, and that happens to be one of our most important crops, and it can look absolutely perfect. And a few hours later, it looks like it's imploded, completely imploded. And this is going to be, and already is, I know that up here in Maine, they are extremely worried about this because of the blueberry crop up here. And again, as a lot of these invasives, no known natural predators at the moment. So these kinds of issues, I think, not just for Sunnyside, but for agriculture everywhere, climate change, invasive species, and other threats are, are increasingly agriculture going to have to figure out how to contend with these and how to adapt to these. How do they do that? Well, uh, one of our thoughts, and this brings me to the second objective of the property, which is to basically try to manage for native biodiversity. I think it's a goal that we would pursue in its own right because we believe it's important. Um, but I, our, our thinking is also that by uh, building in that kind of resilience, uh, we may be better equipped over time uh, to uh, withstand some of the challenges that I have just um, described. Um, I knew you'd like that, Sam. But I, but I, I, so, so how do you manage for biodiversity? I mean, what does that mean? And that's one of the questions I was trying to figure out. I've been trying to figure out. Uh, I'm not a biologist. I'm not a scientist. But I didn't want an anecdotal approach to this. So a couple of years ago, we made the decision to hire a conservation biologist as part of our farm team, and that's Sam, our conservation manager. One of the first things I asked Sam to do was to, do, was, was to begin the work of effectively an all taxa biodiversity assessment, because it's difficult to manage something if you don't know what it is effectively that you're managing. So we've tried to develop, in conjunction with partners, a sense of you know, what different species of plants do we have. Uh, you know, uh, looking at, 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 at our insects, um, looking at our amphibians, 
uh, are reptiles. Uh, this is Sam uh, checking a, a, a hoop net trap for, for snapping turtles. Um, uh, this is a uh, timber rattlesnake, a species of conservation concern in Virginia. I could also say a species of considerable concern to my wife, who's not happy that we have them on the property. Um, we have to date seen about 146 different varieties of birds on the property, including this um, cedar waxwing. We have lots of wild turkeys. Um, we have a very uh, healthy population of large mammals, um, all of which interact with the farm in different ways. Uh, coyotes are relatively new uh, to our neck of the woods. Um, we have a lot of bear, uh, a lot of bear, um, and to me anyway, a, a surprising number of bobcats. These last pictures were taken with a, with a wildlife camera up in the woods, so I actually have only seen one bobcat, but we, we have, according to the cameras, a fair number. So again, though the goal is not just to uh, assess the biodiversity, our goal is to increase it, is to manage for it. How do you do that? Uh, a lot of people say, well, the way to do that is just let it go, let nature take its course. That would be disaster for us. You're talking about a farm that has been managed in one way or another by people for hundreds of years. Uh, a lot of, quote, disturbed land. If we just let it go, what you would find is the property largely overtaken by a relatively small number of species, most of them invasive. You would see a decline, not an increase in biodiversity, I think. So we decided that one of our first priorities was to really wrap our arms around the problem of invasive plants. Um, and what we're doing here is using a backhoe to rip out uh, Ilanthus, or tree of heaven, which like a lot of these invasive trees is, or invasive plants in general, very fast growing, um, in this case, allelopathic, it's toxic in the soil to other plants, and it is useless from a wildlife standpoint. But this is my favorite uh, invasive story from, from the farm. So uh, this is what a fair bit of the property looked like when we bought it. For a variety of reasons, this land, does, th this pasture does not fit into our agricultural model. Um, what you're looking at there is an invasive species monoculture. That's all fescue. That's a fescue pasture. Fescue is an invasive grass. It's ubiquitous. It's your backyard grass for the most part. But it is worthless, mostly, from a biological standpoint. And how are we managing this pasture? Well, we were mowing it. And we were mowing it several times a year and taking labor and fuel to do that. What's a better land use? Well, we asked ourselves that question, and we decided to take these lands that were in fescue pasture and turn them into meadows seeded with native grasses and wildflowers. Somewhat of a convoluted process, but the bottom line is that you start with this, and several years later, if you're lucky, you get this. It's the same meadow. Um, and what you've done is you've turned, again, a single species monoculture into a diverse mosaic of grasses and forbs that have multiple benefits, not just aesthetically very pleasing, uh, but they also attract a lot of species uh, to them, including a large variety of insects, small mammals, and other critters. And as for management, you're not mowing multiple times a year. You're using prescribed fire to manage these meadows as the primary management technique. And these meadows are burned every second or every third year. And basically, once they're established, that's it. This is Sam probably in his favorite role as conservation <laughs> manager. <laughs> Um, so if one goal is to grow food and the other goal, goal is to grow biodiversity, the sort of holy grail, right, is to look at the intersection between those two. In other words, how do you grow food in a way that benefits biodiversity and how do you grow biodiversity in a way that benefits food? And that is really, that is the core question that we are trying to think about and look at and understand and we're really just at the beginning stages of doing it. Um, those meadows that I just talked to you about, yes, they're beautiful to look at, and yes, they uh, attract all these critters, but they also perform a couple of extremely valuable ecosystem services that benefit the property. The most obvious is pollination. These are meccas for, for pollinating insects, and that's obviously a very important service to us. Funnily enough, this is actually one of my favorite slides in, in, in the whole presentation. Um, I told, you, I told you about ripping out ailanthus trees. Well, that's a piece of ailanthus wood from a tree that we felled, chopped up, drilled holes in it. To do that, we, we, effectively what we're doing is we're creating an artificial nest for the orchard mason bee. So we're taking a waste product, we're turning it into an artificial nest for possibly one of our most important native pollinators. We also provide artificial nesting habitat for a variety of birds that are important predators on agricultural pests, including the eastern bluebirds, 
eastern screech owls, um, American kestrels, um, and barn owls. I don't yet have a good picture of a barn owl, but I'm working on it. There, is, there are two barn owls roosting in that box, but I don't. Uh, in, in, in a lot of these cases, you're talking about birds that are having conservation problems across their range because of declining habitat. So we're doing multiple things. We're providing habitat for a species that's in trouble, and we're also getting a very valuable ecosystem service that those species provide. There are also things that you can do on the agricultural side that have benefits for, for, for conservation. Um, uh, anyone who knows much about organic agriculture knows that cover cropping is sort of fundamental. Cover cropping is fundamental to agriculture, organic agriculture, because it prevents erosion, it builds healthy soil. It can also be an important, provide an important food source for beneficial insects and, and other critters. So in, in his talk, uh, Sam is going to, you know, sort of delve a little more into detail from a scientific standpoint on this relationship between conservation and agriculture. Um, I, I want to close looking at that relationship from a very different lens, um, a very personal lens, and I hope you'll indulge me on this, but um, this is my son, Jack, and uh, one of my, I can maybe you could say my most important goal uh, for this, for the farm, for me, and where I derive the greatest satisfaction is from scenes like this, and yes, they are eating kale, right? <laughs> they are eating kale. I, um, uh, but it's to go beyond teaching them where their food comes from and to helping them develop an understanding of the ecosystem in which that food is produced. And that includes uh, developing an understanding of species whose um, presence on the property actually helps to contribute to our food production, and also species whose presence on the property is actually enabled or made possible by the way that we farm. Uh, here Jack is hunting for his first red-spotted newt and holding one in his hand. Uh, and a year later, um, doing the same thing with a spotted salamander. And, you know, I told you that I got into this, I was in a pretty cynical place when I got into this business. And a very quick remedy for cynicism is watching the expression on a young boy's face when he experiences spring peepers on a March evening. And it was louder than this, I guarantee it. <laughs> <laughs> That's my audience um, at the end of the day. That is what matters the most uh, to me and uh, gives me the greatest joy about being on the place. Um, but we are obviously, uh, uh, well, we're trying to do a lot of things and um, uh, we have a lot of different audiences, um, uh, you know, our customers and, and, and a broader audience beyond that. So um, Sam is going to talk to you uh, next about really what it means to be uh, a farm biologist and I will turn it over to, 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 to him uh, right now. Thank you. Well, hey, I'm Sam. I'm the Farm at Sunnyside's Conservation Manager, and that is very different. And it's tough to find a farm that has a full-time biologist. And what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about how we're trying to integrate conservation practices into a real farm business. A um, couple disclaimers, though. One, I'm a scientist. I'm not a farmer, so you guys know way more about growing tomatoes than I do. Please don't ask. I will disappoint. The second is, we're spending a lot of time talking about the positives, and I don't want to give the impression that we have everything figured out and that squirrels help us pick apples and it's just this <laughs> paradise. That's not true, but there's too much focus on the negative aspects of food production. I'm going to talk a little more about this. And scientists need to focus more about the positive ways in which biodiversity and agriculture can interact. So um, let me begin. I just needed to throw that picture in there. I love that picture. It's like, yeah. So what I, what I am going to talk about is just a little bit of background information on just the current understanding among conservationists of the importance of agriculture and biodiversity. But then, most importantly, I'm just going to talk about what I do every day. So what, uh, I, oh, why are you being taped? What the heck would a <laughs> biologist on a farm actually do? So I'm going to detail that and talk about the ways in which we can assess how our actions are affecting wildlife. Uh, this is the only picture not from the farm. I have no idea where that is. Uh, but it's important because Agriculture, and that's production of food for people, feed for livestock, permanent pastures, medicine, biofuels, all of that. That's over a third of the Earth's ice-free dry land. No other human practice poses a greater threat to biodiversity than agriculture. 
And the really tragic part, the really just ironic part of it, is that food production as we know it today is completely dependent on biodiversity. The very biodiversity that it jeopardizes, over a third of all crops globally require insect pollination or animal pollination of some sort by bats, birds, and the outputs of, let's see, about 87 of the world's biggest crops, that's medicines too, are increased by pollinator visitations. All this information is locked up in peer-reviewed journals. Scientists and farmers often have the same desires to protect the wild species that live on farmland. And yet scientists in our well-meaning academic viewpoint, we tend to publish all of this great research and all these great ideas and send it off to die in peer-reviewed journal articles. There are many parallels between modern farmers, the sustainable food movement of today, and this ethic of preserving species. Just like the biodiversity crisis, we are now in an agrodiversity crisis in which fewer and fewer species make up an ever-growing proportion of our diet. Just 10 crops, I'm not gonna list them all, that's too much showing off, but wheat, beans, maize, just 10 crops are over two-thirds of global cropland. We're losing all of these heritage varieties of, of ugly tomatoes and these delicious tasting things in favor of perfect looking tasteless food. Farmers recognize this. They're working to preserve what it took our species thousands of years to create. The same ethic runs within conservationists. We have so much in common, but we're usually saying the same thing in different rooms. And one of the ways that we can improve that communication is through a change in tone. I can talk all sorts of trash about scientists because I am one, but we often say things in such a draconian way. And we talk about farmers as if their act of creating food for the world is killing the planet. We need to instead focus on promoting the value of wild species in agriculture, measuring that value and giving that information to farmers because that's what affects their bottom line. There's lots of examples like pumpkins. Biodiversity makes pumpkins bigger. It's true. It's true with lots of fruits. And many recent studies has, have looked at the effect of diversity on fruit production. And they have found that fruit production actually increases in many situations in association with higher insect pollinator diversity, not with the abundance of pollinators, with the diversity of the pollinators present. Tomatoes too, now you guys probably know better than me that tomatoes are self-fertile. However, for cross-pollination purposes, as much as I love honeybees, they haven't learned as many tricks as our native bees, such as buzz pollination. You guys know about this? Species like our bumblebee will wedge themselves in a tomato flower and they buzz at a particular frequency. It's about middle C, and that causes the pollen to be ejected. They can access it. Honeybees, they just haven't figured that out yet. These ugly but delicious tomatoes, if we want to cross-pollinate them, they require native species. Just to set the stage a little bit for how I'm going to talk about our farm, much of the debate among scientists right now about agriculture and biodiversity centers on really deciding what the superior ideology in agriculture is and its effect on biodiversity. These two you know, opposite ends, very black and white, are land, land sparing and land sharing. Now, land sparing is, let's best described as industrial agriculture, large field sizes, usually monocrops, think of like large swaths of corn in Iowa. Some conservationists actually promote this method of farming, the idea being that if you increase your per unit production on a piece of land, that frees up more land for wildlife to be protected in the form of nature reserves. On the opposite end of the spectrum, is land sharing. It's also called wildlife friendly farming. Now, in this system, field sizes tend to be smaller, crop rotations more diverse, and the landscape mosaic is much more heterogeneous. And you often see this system in today's growing interest in small, often organic farms, where there's you know, some field and then a hedge full of native species and lots of unfarmed lands that provide habitat for wildlife. In these farming systems, yields are often lower, not always, but wildlife can still use a farm as habitat. Now, I'm here to figure out if that's true. Anytime I go to a farmer's market and I see some sign that says like ecologically grown vegetables, my first question is, well, says who? How are you measuring this? So that's what we're trying to sort out at the farm. 
<clears throat> Here we are again. Um, I like maps. I make all these maps. GIS is pretty much the most marketable skill for a scientist right now. Take those classes. You'll get over the hump. You'll learn to love it. I know it's so frustrating for like years, but it's so useful. As you can see, those yellow areas, yellow, these are our growing areas. The other 90% we manage for biodiversity. Now look at that mixture of land use types. We've got hedges. We've got these uh, green areas that are these warm season meadows that Nick was talking about. This is a large property and it's complex. Another big failing in the scientific community when talking about wildlife on farms in these wildlife friendly situations is they often refer to farmed land and wild land as either managed land or unmanaged land. That is wrong. Like Nick was saying, in these highly modified landscapes, if you let pieces of land go, there is no guarantee that will actually be high quality wildlife habitat. So how do we measure these things and actually work towards that? And it takes a little bit of work. So that brings me to what it is I do. Uh, you can break up my day into a few main areas. I'll just list them here and then we'll go into a little bit of greater detail. That is from my door. Isn't that great? Okay. Uh, the first area we call ecological monitoring. That's kind of keeping track of local weather patterns, water chemistry data. Like Nick said, we're working to inventory all the biodiversity on our property. Conservation management is what we call our work to create, enhance, alter habitat to improve it for wildlife. That's also things like removing invasive plants. And wild products. This is our shameless promotion of biodiversity. It's harvesting wild berries, wild herbs, showing people the value of these species in our diet. And finally, um, I help out a lot at the farm. All of you farmers know it's always useful. I have an extra set of hands, a guy that can drive a truck. Yeah. All right, so first, one of the things that is so useful in farming to have someone who really likes numbers and to fill out Excel spreadsheets is the monitoring of the environmental variables that are so important to the farm business. Agriculture, more than any other business, is dependent on the stability and quality of its natural resources, and particularly water. We've extensively mapped all of the water resources on the property and we monitor them monthly with water chemistry testing. We also study bioindicator populations that can give you a broader view of the health of those systems, like these stream salamanders and macroinvertebrates. This isn't just good information for us. It's actually a great marketing point. Customers like to hear that the water that we use to irrigate their crops is better than the average drinking water in the United States. We're also focused on increasing our storage capacity. In the face of a changing climate where the weather patterns may be less reliable, we want to be more resilient, so increasing the amount that we can store. Speaking of weather, we, uh, we have a great weather station that takes data every half hour. It's very high quality, it's research stuff, and this is not just invaluable information for us. We actually post this in real time on the website. It's a service for the community who wants to see exactly how much it rained in the county that day. And in theory, could draw more traffic to our website because people want to check the weather. So uh, in inventorying biodiversity, <coughs> let me just say that the reason we're doing this, me and Nick and his family and the farm manager, Sean, and just everyone there, we're doing this because we believe all of these wild species deserve to share our land with us and have an inherent right to exist, full stop. However, there is still great utility in understanding the dynamics of these populations, information that is very useful to a business. Here's some examples of our totally stealth camera that nothing ever notices. <laughs> this is one of our many sampling techniques, but it often gets some pretty good pictures. That's actually, a Nick showed a picture, that's one of three triplets. We have a sow that has produced triplets um, over the course of three years, which is a sign of excellent body condition, and it's fun to see them grow up. Bobcat, hello. <laughs> <laughs> Some guy, see, they're just totally, you never see these things in the woods, ever. So not only is it interesting pictures, but using these cameras, other sampling techniques, live traps, tracking, scat analysis, we can determine how these species are using the property. And also, we can get some information on very interesting species, some of conservation significance, like this. It's not actually on Mars, that camera broke that day, but there's a bobwhite quail. They're meadow specialists. 
when we put those native meadows in, the quail showed up. Our actions directly resulted in the presence of a conservation significant species with very specific habitat requirements. We can also see more elusive species. Here, I'll help you out. There's long-tailed weasel. This one's gonna be even tougher. You can barely see it, but that is spotted skunk. Spotted skunk is a tier four species in our state of great conservation need. Did you guys know there's a spotted skunk? It's like the striped skunk, but it's only the size of a squirrel. They're the ones that do a handstand to skunk you. It's very cute, but just as smelly. We have these living and breeding on our land. It's interesting that we can say that. But having this information allows us to reduce conflicts with wildlife. Here again, we see just the yellows are growing areas. These red areas are areas that we've identified as highly trafficked wildlife corridors, again, through all these sampling techniques. Now, if we put the chickens near an area that we know the bobcats like to hang out and the chickens get eaten, whose fault is that? Some of the most beautiful wildlife is also the most dangerous. This is a juvenile copperhead. See his yellow tail up there? All the juveniles have that. Uh, this is where he should be. This is a nice forest, really rocky, some open patches, but where he actually was was in Nick's pool. I don't want to like keep talking about me and what I do, but having a biologist who's trained to deal with dangerous animals on staff cuts down on a lot of animals that need to be euthanized to make sure people are safe. These are very dangerous things. Since I've been there, we don't have to kill venomous snakes anymore. We can safely relocate them to other areas. Ticks are another thing. This is a sampling with a felt drag cloth. You know, ticks are just nasty. They're horrible, horrible things, and I hate them, and they spread lots of diseases. <laughs> We're doing this not just for the information on the ticks, but the first question I often get when we talk about creating these tall grass meadows is, aren't you just creating a haven for ticks? Well, we can quantify that. And if we sample in different land use types, we see that these meadows, these very complex meadows with a huge ecology attached to them actually have the fewest ticks and the lowest diversity of ticks compared to just those monoculture fescue pastures that we saw. Since coming to the farm, I've been really excited to see that farms can not only have a net zero impact on biodiversity, but in some situations can actually provide a critical piece of habitat for a species life history. This is an old cattle watering pond. Yeah, we don't have cattle anymore, so it hasn't been used. It has become a functional ephemeral wetland. It supports populations of pool breeding species like the spotted salamander, wood frogs, and lots of American toads, which are the best animal in the world. Uh, it's surrounded by a drift fence. There are pits sink sunk into the ground. Nick showed you a picture of a bucket full of herps. Just delightful to see that. And that's all from greenhouse plastic and tomato steaks. Now we can actually study these populations to ensure that they're not just breeding there and oh look, it's neat, look, they're salamanders, aren't we great for the environment? We can study them and make sure that they're actual source populations and not just sinks. If there are situations in which our artificial habitat has created a sink, we can change those things and improve it in the future. Like I said, I've searched everywhere for ephemeral pools. I'm an amphibian guy, they're just great. I can't help but giggle when I see one. The only ones I have found on the property are artifacts of human activities. I have not found a single natural occurring pool. They're all either old cattle watering ponds or spring boxes. It's really interesting to see that our activities as farmers may be providing something critical to these species. All right, check this out. This is that pool. Um, earlier this year. This is going to take a sec, but this is... Spotted salamanders have explosive breeding events where they all come out for one night of fun a year. And it's crazy. Hundreds and hundreds in this pool. You hear wood frogs and then some peepers. There's not enough time to talk about amphibian breeding. It's really cool. Uh, you guys can ask me later. I'll talk all day about this, but this is just amazing to see. And that's happening in an old cattle watering pond. 
Ground nesting birds like killdeer get the unknowing benefit of laying their eggs in our fields and they're protected from some predators by our deer fences. Some species like Carolina wren, they'll nest right in our toolboxes. Now, I mean, that's not exactly convenient for us as a bird, but this gives us great inspiration on how we can create more artificial nesting for them in the future. And so the biggest part of what a biologist does on a farm is what we call a conservation management. This is shaping the land to improve it for wildlife. Now, um, we don't just put in habitat. It's not okay to just say, let a piece of land go and stuff's gonna live there. We are very strategic on how we create habitat, the mixes of species we use, the density at which we plant, the place on the landscape that we situate it. This meadow here, you can see there, that drains all of the, the water coming off the mountain and filters it going into our irrigation ponds. It also stabilizes the soil. Some of the species have roots that go down over eight feet. That's a lot of carbon storage. Compare that to trees, like maybe 18 inches, two feet. Creating habitat is not something that scientists should just tell farmers to do. It often requires a little bit of expertise. This is one of those warm season grass meadows at year zero. I'm gonna show you just a few slides like Nick did. And what we've done is removed all the cover. A year later, it's bare. And then we seed it, and then the following year we get this. That is not just throwing seeds down. There's a lot of planning that needs to go into that to ensure it's actually providing for wildlife. Just another example, I like this picture. Look at that, quite a difference. That was all fescue, it's a biological desert. It may make good hay, but it's not great for wildlife. Having someone on staff that learns how to recognize things like invasive plants has a, gives you the benefit of having a first responder on the ground all the time to address issues from plants like this. All the green there is Japanese honeysuckle. It's an invasive. We can target these areas and deal with them before they become a problem. Some fescue patches remaining. Here's a good one. Uh, do you guys know mile a minute? You don't get it up here. We found this patch of mile a minute, nasty invasive, in an isolated spot of woods. There is nothing else growing here. That's a single season's worth of growth. And stuff completely takes over. And we were able to deal with this before it spread. This is not only an ecological nightmare. Imagine having to weed this every day out of your fields. And putting habitat in is not enough. You've got to maintain it. Now, in long term, it is less work than constant mowing, but it requires a little bit of expertise. And fire is one of those things that you know, we know from our county, people shouldn't just start fires and expect to manage habitat properly. People get in a lot of trouble doing that. And we are strategic on how we create habitat. Connectivity is very important. Do not make isolated patches of habitat. Make connections. Follow these corridors where wildlife want to be. And there's no reason why restoration can't pay for itself. We choose species not just because they're good for pollinators or crop pest predators, but because they're beautiful. One of the ways in which we think we can pay for our restoration efforts is by selling them. We cut and bunch these wildflowers and we sell them at our farmer's markets. It's a really interesting narrative. Customers like the story that these aren't just grown in a field. These are paying for restoration work that provides habitat for wildlife. We can also use the life history of insects to understand where we need to put habitat. Many species of, of bees, especially bumblebees, when they're foraging, they fly up and they key in on floral displays of particular dimensions. We can put displays like that in areas that have nothing nearby to draw pollinator traffic to where we need it. Every farm you see is gonna have a bluebird box, but we know enough about the life history needs of these species to position them to both give the birds the best possible nest, but to get the most out of their pest control services. I just, I like that little owl. I had to show him again. Farms also have a lot of the heavy equipment you can use to create habitat. Here we're putting in an ephemeral pool with our back out, and this is something that we turned into an educational event. We thought we'd invite the community out for half a day to learn about ephemeral pools and the species that need them and how to create them on their own land. And we charged a small admission to do that, which paid for the time on the machine and generated some revenue for the farm.
Here's that pond later in the year, and here it is a few days ago. It's stabilized, it's crystal clear, and I hope to see eggs in it soon. Staffing a biologist also has the advantage of preparing for the inevitable changes in the world, such as invasive plants. We have all this yellow here. That is, was, yeah, was dominated by this tree of heaven, a nasty plant. Now, removing all of these trees gave us some insight into what might happen to the forest regeneration when this guy comes through. This is emerald ash borer. He's now been reported in our county. We know he's coming. It's just a matter of time before we lose a significant portion of our canopy. All ash trees are going to die. We need to be prepared for that. We need to know how the forest floor will respond. And we're afraid that after the canopy opens, we're going to have nothing but invasive plants. But we have a system in place to address that when the need arises. Just a little more detail on that um, use of the Alanthus blocks to create nesting habitat. Not only is that one of our study sites for forest regeneration, but this is how we addressed improving pollination in our orchards. We situated each block at an acre, and we put 60 holes designed for the blue mason bee in each block, and they really used them. We got a lot of data on how they preferred the height of the block to be, or what materials were better for them. And we didn't really have great data on changes in fruit production, but we know that we were more pollinators in the interiors where we needed them. We also use a lot of that Alanthus bark as our mulch, which is just poetic justice. I, I love doing that. And, well, there's no shame in promoting biodiversity. And let me be clear, I'm not saying that every farmer should go out and strip their land of resources. What I am saying is, People are interested in these native foods. They're very interested. And us as farmers, we found that we can charge a premium for species. For example, pawpaws, largest edible Native, Ameri native fruit in North America. It's delicious. It's in the custard apple family. It tastes kind of like a mango and a banana. It's so good for you. Uh, it has three minor pests. One of them is the zebra swallowtail butterfly. That's it requires almost no maintenance compared to a peach tree, no spraying. It's highly resistant to every insect that wants to lay eggs in it, does not get spotted wing drosophila eggs in it. I have asked every entomologist in the state if it gets plum cuculio, none of them think it does. It makes a lot of sense for us, and when you can charge $11 a pound for these things, those are the arguments farmers want to hear. Spice bush berries. The lowly spice bush that everyone in our zone hates because it forms these thickets in the woods and you can't walk through it. Well, we can dry them and sell them in little bags and make a lot of money on them. This is the value of native species and people like that message. Uh, okay, so honeybees aren't native. They've been naturalized since the 1600s. I love my bees. There's nothing wrong with using bees to turn these restored areas into a value-added product. These bees are turning flowers into money for us. We're using this honey to pay for restoration costs. We think that once we sort the system out, this could be a serious money maker to fund all of our habitat creation. And that allows us, that story allows us to charge almost a dollar an ounce for our honey. And people buy it up like crazy. Well, that's pretty much it. In closing, sorry, it's kind of a joke from the car. There's a lot that farmers and biologists have in common. We need to improve our communication. We need to realize that we're both addressing the same things. And we just got to talk more. I'm just going to stop there. So thanks so much. You guys can ask us questions if you have more. Thank you.